Okay, well, uh, thanks so much to the organizers for, the, uh, for putting the paper on the program and for the chance to present it. And since I believe I'm closing out the program, um, thanks for just organizing such a great conference. It's uh, my first time here and I've really enjoyed the last few days. So thanks very much for, for an excellent, um, excellent experience. Um, so this paper is joint with Jasun Lee, who's at George Mason University. Um, and in this paper, um, perhaps fitting for the last paper on the program, we're thinking about something that's a little bit new um, and a little bit different, and that is this recent phenomenon of um, initial coin offerings, or ICOs. Um, so I'm sure at this point everybody has heard of ICOs. Uh, the basic idea is to pre-sell a, a product or service before it's actually available. Um, a startup will pre-sell this product or service um, doing it by actually creating digital records on a blockchain that's effectively like a new currency that exists only for the startup uh, in question. Um, sell those tokens or coins in advance and then um, use the proceeds to actually fund the development of the project. Uh, later on, the tokens that have been sold will be used, will be redeemable for the product or the service that the startup is actually trying to, uh, trying to launch. So this market basically didn't exist until 2017, um, but then sort of out of nowhere uh, during that year, about 1,000 of these things raised over $10 billion um, in the aggregate of proceeds. And during 2018, although the year was sort of seen as a down year for this market because the average proceeds to an ICO went down, um, nevertheless, there were about twice as many, and the aggregate proceeds actually went up to about $11 billion. Um, for some comparison here, in 2018, the National Venture Capital Association uh, reported $41 billion of total venture capital investment in the United States, and of that, less than $10 billion was angel or seed financing. So this is a really big deal um, in the world of sort of entrepreneurship and startup financing. Uh, so the basic question that we're sort of still struggling with, I think, is just really how to think about this market on a basic level. Um, the, sort of the initial reaction that many people have is to think of this activity as an alternative to, sort of a pure substitute for um, equity issuance like equity markets or venture capital. But when you go in that direction, um, you start to think, well, the, those markets are pretty well developed, um, the contract space is pretty rich, and it's a little bit hard to believe that this type of setup really is gonna bring anything very new to the table purely as a sort of equity financing alternative except perhaps in the form of regulatory arbitrage, um, because the SEC has not yet cracked down on the sale of essentially unregistered equity securities to unqualified investors on the blockchain. Um, so the point of this paper is going to be to tell you that um, using a model, that in fact the ICO setup can accomplish something economically valuable that's different from a pure substitute for equity issuance. Um, we're gonna show you that based on a sort of very simple insight about what these projects are generally trying to do, at least the most reasonable ones. I'm gonna argue that the model I'm showing you will endogenize uh, many of the features of the ICO that we structure that we actually see in practice, and therefore the overall conclusion is gonna be that basically we're, we're presenting to you the right model to have in mind um, for regulators or practitioners in assessing um, the value of any individual ICO and in thinking about the kind of guidelines and rules uh, that might bring greater integrity to this market. Okay, so the basic motivating observation is gonna be that sort of the most reasonable looking ICOs, the ones that are most interesting from a theoretical perspective, and that have sort of exhibited the most stability and, and, and success, are ones that are associated with um, launching business models that look like peer-to-peer uh, -peer platforms of one kind or another. So I can give you many examples. I'll just give a couple here in, in, in this presentation. Uh, one very well-known example of such an ICO is called Filecoin. And what this company is essentially trying to do, the visual here kind of really, I think, gets the point across. Um, they are setting up a decentralized network on which uh, users can basically rent disk storage space to each other. And on that platform, the way the transactions will work is that there's a special currency called Filecoin um, that you have to purchase if you want to use the platform, and then you can use that currency to compensate others, or you can accumulate that currency by renting out your own um, disk space. So in order to distribute these tokens into users' uh, hands initially, Filecoin conducted one of the most successful ICOs to date and raised about $200 million um, by selling them. The product itself is still sort of under development um, at this point. Another example would be Ethereum itself. So um, now you know, it's getting pretty widely adopted as a currency, um, but the original point of Ethereum was to support a network on which users could run applications in a secure manner using each other's processors. Um, and so the Ethereum, uh, Ethereum itself was distributed um, using another initial coin offering that was also very successful. And we can give many other examples um, in the paper. I'll just skip them for now and say that our starting point is going to be um, imagining a startup that is trying to launch a platform of some kind or another and imagining how the initial coin offering structure can be helpful um, for that type of a, a startup. 
So the important observation here is that this is just a standard fact or a standard uh, motivation in the networks and platform literature, is that the value of this type of business is driven by the interactions of users with each other. And so the reason that's important, the problem it presents for starting a project of this nature, is that the um, interactions of the users, the fact that they are creating value by interacting with each other, is going to lead naturally to a strategic complementarity in their decision whether or not to use the platform, and that naturally leads to multiple equilibria, um, including a self-fulfilling bad equilibrium in which no one uses the platform even when it's a socially valuable thing to do. So that's the setting we're thinking about. Now, we're not the only paper out there that is arguing that um, network effects and multiple equilibria are important for the types of projects associated with ICOs. There's a few other theory papers that are sort of thinking about the implications of that for like fragility between the multiple equilibria on the platform and things like that. Um, the really unique contribution in our paper is going to be to argue that actually the ICO structure itself uh, can be useful as a way of selecting the good equilibrium and sort of selecting away from the bad equilibrium. So the point of the model is just going to be to get that point across and then show you how some of the features of these ICOs in practice arise endogenously out of that, that type of a setup. Okay. So to be a little bit more precise, um, I said that platforms feature network effects. Um, in the literature, these come in two different types. There's a cross-side network effect, and there's a same-side network effect. We're going to set up a model that sort of, by assumption, creates a cross-side network effect. What that means is that on a model in a platform with um, two sides, so buyers and sellers, um, a cross-side network effect is that each side cares about the participation of the other side. So buyers care about sellers' decisions to participate. Sellers care about buyers' decisions to participate. We're going to set up a model where, by assumption, that type of network effect um, is present. And we're going to argue that the use of an ICO with a token that's specific to this platform um, can help to alleviate that type of network effect. The next thing we're going to show is that when we have that setup, though, endogenously, a different network effect arises as well. And it's going to be a same side network effect. This is the sort of the second flavor of network effects, often just sort of assumed we're going to show that it actually arises endogenously in our model. A same side network effect is where participants in the platform on one side care about the decisions of the people on the same side. So in that case, buyers care about the decisions of other buyers on the platform. Uh, so we're going to show that that problem, like I said, arises endogenously, but can be addressed by many structural features of the ICO um, that are actually observed in practice. And so all in all, like I said, this is going to suggest that um, we sort of have the right way, hopefully, to think about ICOs. And if you want to think about guidance for this market, um, you, can, uh, you, can, you can think about rules that would um, help with this, type of, with this type of setup. Okay, so with that, with that said, let me talk about the model itself. So the model basically is going to be a very simple model of trade on a platform. Um, the way it works is this. It's a discrete time infinite horizon, so the platform is going to operate on all these dates. And each date is going to be divided into a morning and a night uh, sort of sub-date. On the platform, there's going to be two types of users, uh, type A and type B. And to start with, I'm only going to have one user of each type for the next few slides. It's going to make this all sort of very simple to think about. Um, the difference between them is just going to be a timing difference that we use to create the gains from trade between them. Okay, so the way this works is that type A in every morning um, can get utility flow of S from a service that at that time can be provided by type B. Then when the night time comes, um, they switch. So at that time, uh, type A can provide the service, and type B gets the utility from the service. OK, so the utility flow from the service is always S. The utility cost of providing the service is always C. Um, I don't have it written down here, but we are discounting between uh, dates at an exogenous sort of discount rate. Um, also, we're going to assume that for either side, at any sub-date, there's always a participation cost U to just show up and even attempt to uh, use the platform. And the reason we're doing that is to create the coordination problem that I'm, that I'm trying to talk about here. Uh, nevertheless, trade is always socially optimal. Um, so even despite all the utility costs that everyone's incurring, uh, we all sort of want this platform to happen. It's a socially efficient thing for trade to be happening at every possible, every possible sub-date. All right. So let's just think about a benchmark, first of all, of what would happen if you tried to launch this platform um, just using um, sort of dollars or any other sort of standard currency to allow users to transact with each other. So this is a world where the entrepreneur launches the platform. It connects users with each other. But all they do is trade with each other using dollars. Now, we set this up so that there's no coincidence of wants at any date. Like, at any date, there's not um, something we can trade with each other for value. But that's fine. Money already addresses that problem. The problem that's going to arise in this case is really the participation cost U. Um, we can't coordinate to both actually show up and use the platform. And so that sort of, by assumption, is creating a coordination failure that can happen at every single possible date on the platform. And so just a very basic limit here is going to be that there is an equilibrium in which uh, trade never actually happens, self-fulfilling sort of bad 
coordination failure outcome. And so that is basically a cross-side network effect that we've set up, and you're seeing the natural implication of it here. Obviously, it creates a problem for the entrepreneur in trying to start this platform because you can't guarantee that users will actually show up and use it even when um, the idea for the platform is valuable. Okay, so how do you uh, go about selecting the efficient equilibrium and sort of preventing the bad equilibrium here? So what we're going to do now is introduce onto this platform, instead of trade happening with um, sort of normal currency, instead it's going to happen with a currency that exists only for use on this platform, a token. So let me define precisely what we mean by a token. Um, it's going to have two defining features in our model. Number one is that it has no intrinsic value, so in that sense it's going to look like money um, in sort of classic money models. Um, it's not going to have any cash flows associated with it, so it explicitly is not an equity security. Um, the only value of the token is going to be the fact that on the platform, you can exchange one token for one unit of the service. Okay? What that means is that for anybody to use the token, um, they're going to have to, sorry, for anybody to use the platform, they're going to have to purchase the token in advance. And in particular, before the very first date that the platform operates, uh, type A is going to have to purchase these tokens from the entrepreneur. So we're going to think of that initial sale of the token as the initial coin offering in our model. That's, that's where it's happening. Um, okay. So then after that point, the uh, platform operation over the infinite horizon is just operating as a subgame of that extended game. We're going to be thinking about subgame perfect equilibria. Um, once we get to the platform's operation, for simplicity, we're focusing on Markov perfect equilibria. Uh, the very important thing, though, is that when there's more than one equilibrium, we're going to choose between them based on the equilibrium refinement of forward induction. Um, so that's very important. I'm going to come back to it in just a second, explain how it works and why we think that's a very natural refinement to be applying um, in this setting. So the first, that's the first sort of feature of the token. The second feature of the token is much simpler. It's just transparency. Um, everyone can always observe the number of tokens that have been purchased and the price that's been paid for those tokens. And so if you want to know what makes any of this um, related to sort of a blockchain technology type of paper, it's going to be this assumption here. We're assuming a very high degree of transparency about the transactions that have already happened, and that's sort of like a, a, a going assumption in this literature. That, in some sense, is what makes this more feasible with this type of technology than what might have been possible without this technology. Okay, so with that in mind, um, the first uh, sort of main result we're going to offer is that when you set up the platform this way, in fact, the only equilibrium that survives is the efficient one. And because we're focusing on Markov equilibria on the platform, it's going to be actually the equilibrium where trade happens every single date on the platform. The important thing is that the never trade equilibrium is no longer an equilibrium. Um, and the reason is very simple. So in the subgame of the platform's operation, you could still have equilibria of no trade. But when you add the extended game with the initial token sale, just the ability to buy the token initially means that the no trade equilibrium will never, will never be the outcome. And if you're, if you're familiar with the reasoning of forward induction, you can sort of already see uh, why that's the case. The reasoning is the following, that um, on this, in this model, um, when I observe an action by somebody, everyone is going to assume that that action was taken um, in a rational way, rational meaning the following sense, that you would not take a costly action unless you at least were going to attempt in the future to do something that could recoup the cost of the action you just took. And in this setting, that reasoning is very simple. Um, if you purchased a token before, I believe you're going to try to spend it. Otherwise, why would you have purchased the token in the first place? That is the reasoning that we're going to assume that players are applying about each other's actions in this model. Um, it sounds very natural. It is an equilibrium refinement. It's the idea of forward induction. And so what it means is that um, with that with that reasoning, then all that has to happen is type A simply has to buy the token, and then this reasoning is going to go forward, and trade's going to happen at every single date. The coordination failure actually goes away. Okay, so since this is an equilibrium refinement, a natural question is: Is this actually a reasonable description of how people think about each other's behavior um, in reality? And the answer is not only yes. There's actually a pretty extensive experimental literature of people um, behaving in a way that's consistent with forward induction reasoning in practice, but in fact, I want to highlight one particular paper that we, that we uh, reread, uh, sort of putting together the lit review here, and with hindsight, actually looks an awful lot like an ICO. So this is a classic paper from 1993. What the authors do, did is they set up a, uh, a coordination game for their participants to play, and the usual outcome was coordination failure, but then they added, um, they augmented the game with an initial auction for the right to play the game. And what happens then in almost every experiment they ran is that the price in the auction converges to a price above the, e the coordination failure payoff. 
a price that wouldn't make any sense to pay unless we were going to coordinate with each other, and then almost always when the coordination game was played, uh, the efficient outcome actually happened. In hindsight, it looks almost exactly like the way we're describing an ICO, and so I think it's a justification that this is actually a pretty reasonable um, thing to think might be happening in practice. So what it means for our model is that simply by purchasing the token, type A effectively selects the efficient equilibrium. The no trade equilibrium would not survive if he does that, and that means that by simply having the opportunity to do so, um, the entrepreneur guarantees that, um, that the platform will actually be adopted. Uh, one really interesting thing about this is observers of ICOs often wonder, you know, why would anyone buy a new currency that clearly has no chance of overtaking, let's say, Bitcoin, let alone um, a true currency like dollars in terms of adoption. In fact, what's going on here is that that's exactly the reason tokens are useful in this model. The goal is not to launch a general currency, um, but rather to uh, provide a, uh, the ability for users to sort of communicate their future actions. And so a useless token actually makes that communication the most credible of all. So that's sort of the first main result of our paper. Um, now what I'm going to do, though, is extend the model in a more realistic way, uh, not just for realism for its own sake, but also to show you some important stuff that I mentioned earlier that's going to happen. So up till now, we've only had one user on each side of the platform, sort of swapping the token back and forth at all dates. Um, now what we're going to do is extend this to have more than one user on each side of the platform. And so for just for simplicity, we're only going to consider two type A users and two type B users. Um, the platform is basically going to operate as before, except that one detail comes up. And this starts out as a microstructure detail, but it turns out to be something very important, actually, for the way the game works out. The problem is this, that one possible outcome of the initial token sale now will be that only one token is purchased. And if only one token is in circulation, then you've now got four potential users who want to use the platform, only one token in circulation. You can have situations where there's an imbalance in the orders on uh, the two sides of the market. Um, so in particular, you could have a situation where there are two users attempting to supply the service and receive the token, but there's only one token available um, for either one of them to receive in exchange for that. So when that happens, we're going to assume that the market treats the two uh, attempting uh, purchasers of the token um, symmetrically, and they each get an equal probability of actually receiving the token and clearing the trade. So like I said, that starts out as a microstructure issue, but it actually has important implications. Why? Um, no matter how many tokens are purchased, it's going to be a subgame perfect equilibrium for trade to always happen at every date. We can work out the present value of the platform to the users based on their decisions about the, ICO, uh, the token purchase initially, and we come up with the following fact, that there's actually a new kind of complementarity between the purchase decisions of the, um, of the users at the initial date. In particular, here's what I'm going to show you. Um, we can come up with four different present values depending on what the, for the type A user um, at the beginning of the platform's operation, depending on what that type A user and the other user did in terms of purchasing the token. Clearly, if no one uh, purchased a token, then there's no value to anyone. Um, if both players purchased a token, then uh, the play the, each player is going to get a high value. We're going to call this VH, and it's just the discounted value of trade happening at every date, uh, minus the price of the token. But there are also two intermediate cases where either I purchased a token and you didn't, or you purchased a token and I didn't. And um, what happens here is that there's actually some value in, in each of these cases from the fact that even if I did not purchase a token, I can always jump into the platform later on and receive it by sort of supplying the service. And what that means is it effectively creates some value even to the player who doesn't purchase the token initially from the platform's operation. But more importantly, it decreases the value to the person who actually does purchase the token in the case where the other person does not. Because essentially, they're going to lose some value in the case where they fail to get the token at a future date. And so these, these, these numbers here are just sort of being defined here at the bottom of the slide as discounting the payoffs of what happens in each case. But what this does is it creates um, a new sort of strategic complementarity at the initial date where I, as the initial type A user, care about whether or not the other user also purchases the token, and that's going to create um, a, the potential for um, a new type of coordination failure. It's very easy to illustrate by just writing out the static payoffs of present values of, at the initial date from purchasing the token and not purchasing the token. Um, basically what happens here is the entrepreneur can always set the price very, very low and guarantee that everyone will purchase the token. But if the entrepreneur sets, tries to set the price a little bit higher than, let's say, VL, this entry here, then the payoffs here turn into a stag hunt game, and in fact, the, uh, the, the most likely outcome is going to be that nobody purchases the token at all. Okay? So what this means is it's going to constrain the ability of, sorry, can you, sorry, I, I didn't see it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> this is going to constrain the ability of the entrepreneur um, to set 
a price that's attractive from her perspective at the initial date. Like I said, the entrepreneur can always set a low price and guarantee that everyone will purchase the tokens, um, but cannot set a price above VL and guarantee that the platform will actually be um, adopted. If she tries to do that, there could be a coordination failure, again, in which nobody actually buys the token. Why do we care about that? It's not only um, an empirical issue to understand what an entrepreneur would try to do in this situation, but it's also a social issue in the sense that you do want entrepreneurs to be able to recoup the rents from the projects they launch. And if there's any, any obstacle to doing that, um, you could have a situation where if entrepreneurship is sufficiently costly, it just wouldn't be worth launching this project um, in the first place. Okay. So basically what's going on, uh, I already said this, the only way to guarantee full participation is a very low token price. So what can the entrepreneur do um, to try to overcome that problem? We're going to talk about three different methods, um, some more novel than others, some look very much like results that are out there in the literature already. The real point being that each of these sort of looks like something that you actually observe um, in practice with ICOs, and therefore is part of the justification for why we think this is the right paradigm uh, to have in mind to understand why this market could exist in the first place. Okay, so the first possibility is going to be that rather than simply try to just sell the tokens in a single shot game, um, you construct a sufficiently rich sort of multi-stage game in which tokens are being sold. Um, if you do that and set it up with the appropriate escalating price schedule during that sale period, um, it turns out to be the case that the unique outcome is for everyone to purchase the tokens immediately when the ICO starts. Um, that's sort of the most, I think, theoretically interesting result, so I'll talk about it for a minute. The second ones are going to be a little bit more straightforward, but are also things we observe in practice. So first of all, um, a very common practice is to distribute a number of tokens at a relatively low price um, before the ICO actually happens, and then conduct the ICO where the price will be higher and the uptake will be higher. Um, we're going to think of that as just charging one user um, the reservation value, assuming coordination failure, and then after that user purchases the token, uh, charging the higher price to the remaining user. So that's a very simple way to overcome the coordination failure and get some revenues um, while not perhaps getting the maximal amount of revenues. And the last alternative is going to be something called a soft cap. Um, this is the soft cap terminology is within the ICO world again. Uh, it's just that you set a funding target. If the target is not reached, you distribute all the funds back to the people who invested in this in the first place. Um, this is out there a lot in the literature. It goes by different names. Um, it's called all or nothing in the crowdfunding literature. And in, um, there's also some similar results in the public economics literature. Chester has a paper with Phil Dibvig with something very similar to this in, in public economics. So these ideas are kind of out there. Um, all of them actually happen quite a bit in the ICO world. And so I think you can understand them as ways to overcome um, the critical mass constraint that we just sort of worked out in the previous slide. Let me just take a minute and talk about this first one, because I think it is probably the most interesting from a theoretical perspective. And it, again, does conform with something you see in practice that's a little bit hard to understand, I think. Um, without our model. So suppose you're trying to achieve a critical mass of M users. And so in our setup, M is 2. That's the only case I've explicitly worked out for you. But we can actually extend this result um, to M being more than 2. Um, let T, cap T, be the number of dates during which users can purchase um, ICO tokens. If that number of dates is less than the critical mass that you're trying to achieve, then there's an equilibrium in which nobody purchases a token. Uh, but it turns out that if you cr commit to conduct the sale for a sufficiently long amount of time, so t greater than or equal to the critical mass you want, and I should say here also um, with the appropriate price schedule that everyone knows in advance, then the unique equilibrium is going to be for everyone to purchase the tokens during the um, immediate date, during the initial date in which they're available. Um, the reasoning for this has to do with the off-equilibrium path thinking of the participants in the token sale. Um, so each participant thinks it's e easiest to understand in the case with two users, um, but it does extend very nicely beyond that. Each user at the initial date is thinking, um, if I don't buy today and the other person doesn't buy today, then tomorrow we'll still have one more period in which to buy the ICO tokens, but at that date we will have sort of the coordination problem as always. But if I buy today, then essentially tomorrow uh, we only have one user left to achieve the critical mass, and there's only one user um, left making a decision, and now coordination failure is gone. Um, it's sort of privately very clearly optimal for the remaining user to purchase the token. That actually extends, like I said, to an arbitrary number of users um, that you're trying to attract. So it's actually sort of a very nice result in that sense. All you need to do is let users know 
that the ICO is going to last for a sufficiently long amount of time, and that the price schedule is going to follow um, an escalating pattern that this is basically just the exogenous discount rate of users to make sure that no one has any strategic incentive to wait till the next period to buy the tokens. And then it turns out to be the unique outcome that everyone will just buy immediately. Uh, so what this means is you can have, um, number one, this price schedule that actually is a feature of ICOs, um, very com not always, but very commonly. And number two, you can have the feature that even though the ICO is expected to last a long time, um, sort of everyone rushes in at the very beginning and buys immediately, which is sort of exactly what we see um, in practice. So let me see if I can, for example, um, the most successful crowd sale so far was the Ethereum um, pre-sale of these tokens. And what you can see is actually if you were considering whether or not to buy tokens during the, um, during the uh, ICO of Ether, um, you see a price at any moment in time. So at this point, they were sort of exchanging for Bitcoin, obviously, not dollars, because it's more exciting that way. This is the price that you would have paid in terms of Bitcoin to buy Ether. But if you wait, then the price is going to go up. And everyone sort of knows that in advance. Um, the reason that we're saying the entrepreneur commits to this escalating price schedule is just to remove the incentive for anyone to wait. OK, uh, what else? Um, OK, examples of all the things I've talked about. Let me, let me just skip those. OK, so the last thing I want to talk about before just concluding is uh, one very important sort of robustness consideration for our model. Okay, So everything I've written out so far has been in the context of the only people purchasing the tokens are actually users of the platform. Uh, we know that in practice, many of the people who are purchasing tokens are really not planning to use the platform, uh, but rather are sort of speculating on the eventual success of the platform and potentially on the price of the tokens going up. OK, so in our model so far, we have really no scope to even talk about that because it's a game of uh, perfect information. Um, there is no uncertainty, there's no private signals, there's really no role for speculators in that model. But you might think that if we all know that really the, most of the people buying initially are speculating on their private information and not planning on using the token eventually, that that would um, sort of weaken the coordinating power of the token. And you might think of it like this, that the token price would have the ability to aggregate people's information, but by the same token would, um, would weaken the coordinating power of the token. So we have just a dilemma where we extend the model to think about now there's good and bad platforms. Um, we'll eventually find out whether the platform is good or bad. There's a class of speculators who don't care about the token per se, or don't care about the platform per se, but they have private information that they're willing to speculate on. And so they naturally buy in. The price of the good platform converges over time to a high value, et cetera, et cetera. The important thing is that the coordination um, that we're talking about in our main results is achieved regardless of whether or not speculation happens. And the intuition for the proof is pretty simple. It's just that um, in an equilibrium where the speculator was not eventually going to sell the token to a user, it would not have made sense for the speculator to buy that token in the first place. So speculators may or may not participate in this market. But in any case, it's common knowledge that eventually the token will end up in the hands of the user because there's simply no reason for the speculator to hold it indefinitely. Um, and the fa that fact is common knowledge. And so as soon as the token is sold, regardless of the identity of the person who buys it initially, um, it becomes common knowledge that that's going to be one more user eventually um, for this platform down the road. OK, so that's a very important extension to the model. Um, with that in mind, uh, let me just conclude. So it's a pretty simple message that I think we have, uh, but hopefully one that's useful in thinking about this market. So in particular, one of the most pressing questions right, is how regulators should be thinking about ICOs. Do we just treat them as essentially unregistered securities offerings, or is there something uh, potentially more interesting going on that's a little bit different from, um, from just equity issuance by another name? And so you've seen some sort of confusion about how to deal with this uh, with the response of regulators around the world. Um, at the moment, we have, I would say, kind of a case-by-case -case approach where people are still sort of waiting to see what the eventual um, attitude is going to be towards this transaction. Obviously, the ideal thing would be to have um, sort of objective standards, guidance, and, and, and rules that would separate out which ICOs are good and which ICOs are bad. But to get there, you kind of have to start with this fundamental question of why would it even make sense to do this in the first place as opposed to just issuing equity. And so that's really the contribution of our model so far. Um, the, the fundamental point of the ICO in our model is really not about financing. Um, I never said anything about um, overcoming a financial constraint or anything like that. The point was really operational. It does provide funds, and it probably provides funds at a moment when they're very valuable and there may be financial constraints facing the project. But even with an unconstrained entrepreneur, it would make sense to do the type of transaction we're talking about. OK, so the, the basic intuition is trying to overcome network effects that arise for models for, for platforms of this kind. 
the type of setup that we've analyzed, where the tokens have no cash flows and are only going to be used as a medium of exchange, this is sometimes called a utility token setup. Um, and that's a little bit of jargon out there in the world right now. But our point is kind of that that setup really does have some economic sense to it. And when entrepreneurs argue that it's something distinct from security issuance, um, economically at least, that's a reasonable thing um, to, to, to think about. And it brings up a whole new set of attitudes towards what is the I ideal um, regulatory treatment. For example, um, it would not make sense to restrict ICOs to only qualified investors because then you're sort of cutting out the user base that is exactly the set of people that should be um, participating in this in the first place. On the other hand, because we've assumed pretty strong uh, transparency and disclosure of everything that's going on, the potential for things happening sort of off the publicly observable blockchain uh, should be a major concern, and it's something that the SEC is thinking about, like forcing disclosure of activities that aren't publicly observable to everyone. That's probably the most important thing that you could focus on as a regulator in our model. Um, so with that being said, um, that's the basic message of what we have, and I'm looking forward to uh, Itai's comments.